record button, we have once again the one and only Mr. Garrett Kramer. Um, there's not too many people, Garrett, that bring about 100 people from our community. That I, I mean, I do these all the time. 30 people is pretty good. 40 is actually really good. 50 means you're a rock star. 100, I have no idea what that means. That means you're doing either something right or something wrong. I don't know which right. one you're doing. Yeah, we'll but find <laughs> out. <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah. But I, I, before we begin, and I do, I, it's something that we should always do is just kind of give a short background. At this point, I think everybody here knows who you are. But I want to give a little bit of a background to say that me and Garrett periodically jump on calls and just talk about stuff. Just whatever, whatever's going on in the principles, whatever it is. And I will tell you, besides talking about that, one of the things I love about Garrett, and if you guys have, I, I'm sure you guys already know this, Garrett will jump on a call at any moment, at any time, if there's something going on in your world, if there's something that you're not happy with, you're happy with, whatever it is. And I've seen it on your post, Garrett, where you're like, look, let's take this offline, give me a chat. You don't get that too often in, in, in our community, right? It's something that I think that just bleeds of service, bleeds of compassion. And I think it's, it's such an incredible quality because you're a busy dude. I mean, let's be honest, but you do make the time for people in our community. And I think that's such, a, such an incredible thing that you do, Garrett. So I wanted to, from the bottom of my heart, besides the call we're going to do, just thank you for, for being such an incredible person. Hmm, thanks, buddy. Feelings yeah. mutual. Thank you. You're welcome, bud. And on that note, Garrett, let, let's, I do want to talk about, talk a little bit about who you are, but I've seen throughout your years, you've changed a little bit with, with your ideas, with your philosophies. So can you kind of share uh, where you've been and where you're at now and go from there? Well, I would say I've always had a burning curiosity, um, uh, sorry, the video just kind of went a little weird. Someone else popped on, I guess. Um, but a, a burning curiosity, sorry, buddy, I'm going to get here. Okay. A burning curiosity. Um, that there was something uh, more than meets the eye to this existence of ours. And I, I would say this happened very young in, in my life. I don't think this is any different from anyone else. I, 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 would, I would venture to say that virtually everyone on this call lied in bed at night as a child and wondered if there was something more to this game of life than meets the eye. Um, but like most of us, I think, I, I, was, I was too afraid to explore that. Um, I, thought, I thought I would be uh, labeled as weird or out there, um, different. So I swept it under the rug and I, and I followed a different path. And that path involved... Uh, working super hard at athletics, working super hard in school, getting a scholarship at a good school to play college hockey, um, and then moving on from there to play amateur golf at a very high level, as some of you know. All the while, this, this curiosity was just driving me mad. I mean, literally driving me crazy. It was just... Um, eating at me, goading me to, to take a look. But I continued to sweep it under the rug. And in my late 20s, as some of you know, I, I reached a real crisis point in my life where luckily I, the first person I reached out to was a gentleman by the name of Richard Carlson. Now, for those of you, don't, of you who don't know who Richard was, Richard was the gentleman who wrote the series of books called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And Richard befriended me, um, you know, uh, when you were describing my willingness, Amir, to, 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 to talk to people or be open to conversations, I learned that in my very first interaction with Richard. 
Richard was an international, internationally best-selling author, uh, teacher, coach, therapist, and he spent two and a half hours on the phone with me, a virtual stranger, when I first reached out to him. And I, I, I never forgot that. Um, anyway, turns out Richard uh, was, was mentored, was taught by George Pransky. And uh, Richard, and I, in order for me to come out to California where Richard lived, it would, he was on a book tour, so that would have to take a few months. So being the impatient guy I was at the time, Richard suggests that I go to Laconer and spend some time with, with George, which I did. Um, now, you have to understand, this is a, um, a 28-year-old guy who you know, has, has totally swept any therapy, spirituality, any uh, inward exploration right under the rug. So this was a, a real big leap uh, for me. But I took it with ease, actually. Um, and that's when I met George and I spent the week with Keith Blevins. I was supposed to spend the week with Sandy Cott, but at the last minute that got canceled and I ended up with Keith. Anyway, um, that's, that's what started all this, Amir. That's how this all started. Um, now, just I had always been a coach. I had always, uh, at my father's skating rink, my father ran a skating rink. That was his job. And at my father's rink, I used to coach the younger kids. Then I, at the time when I was in my late twenties and early thirties, I coached a prep school, a high school hockey team here in New Jersey. So I had always been a coach. So I had somewhat of a knack to coach. I actually spent one year coaching the JV team at my college after I graduated. I always had a desire and a knack for coaching. That was always something that was, I was a counselor at a sleepaway camp for one summer. So this is something that I always did. So, um, yeah, so spending the week with, with Keith and with, and with George, and then going back a year later, um, that's where it all, that's where I learned about uh, Sid Banks and Sid's work. And that initiated my journey um, into starting a company called Inner Sports, where I brought, I brought this understanding uh, to the world of pro sport. That was a very fortuitous happening. It just kind of fell on my lap at a young age. And I ran with it up until today, 30 years later almost. Um, now, what you're pointing to also is that over the course of all those years, the work has has involved for me. I won't say evolved because it's gone the other way for me. It's it's gone backward. So it's it's been a, um, a journey of stripping away the, my beliefs, belief after belief after belief, until I ended up where I am now, which is I, I think one of the things we're going to talk about today. So is it fair to say, um, Garrett? that if you go back to the Garrett that wrote Still Power, it, it, it's a t completely different person or is there still the same yeah. person? What, what would you say to that Garrett who wrote Still Power then? No question. I've always been the same person. I will always be that. Um, I would describe it as I am, I am, well, you guys may differ. Some of you may differ, but I, my wife may differ, but I am now a more refined uh, personality. So I'm the same person, yet I would describe it as just a more loving, giving, and quite frankly, more honest uh, and genuine uh, person than I was when I wrote that book. Oh, that's, that's how I would describe it. Interesting. So let's get right to it. One of the things that I, that I, really liked speaking to you about was, and it's the title of this, and we can go all, all sorts of ways. And I do want you guys to have, quite, if you have questions, to, to jump in when, when we can. But there was this idea about spirituality and psychology and the mixing of the two. And you elaborated on the call, but I, I, I'd love to have that discussion with you again. Because in your, in your humble opinion, you, you, you do see a difference between psychology and spirituality. Not that one is worse than the other or one's better, but that there are two different 
they're two different ideas or paradigms. Yeah. I want to know why, why you think that and why you believe that's actually useful to even discuss. Well, and well, sure. But to, first, I, I will say at a relative level, I would say there's a difference. Okay. So at a conceptual level, and I can explain what that means if you'd like, but on a conceptual level, there, there are two different concepts. On a, on a truth level, they're clearly all, it's clearly the same. So, but on a relative level, you and me speaking, two guys hanging out, all of us, whatever, speaking to each other, there, at a conceptual level, relative level, there is, there is a difference that I think is, is significant to, to point out, especially in this, in this community. So psychology, psychology is the study of the psyche, the psyche, a self. So psychology is about the ending or, the re- or, or f- trying to find ways to relieve a self, a separate self of suffering. So psychology has, will, has many different, as we know, many different um, avenues that it can follow, that, that a psychologist would, or a psychiatrist would follow in order to help relieve suffering, uh, bring out the best, uh, stuff like that in a person, okay? So that's psychology. And, and psychology, as you know, is a, is a very worthwhile field, a very worthwhile concept. There's nothing uh, in me that would even consider that it's not worthwhile. It absolutely, in, at the right place and time, which we'll talk about, is worthwhile. However, spirituality is all about the dissolution of the psyche, all about the, the dissolution of the personal. So it's, it's moving 180 degrees in the opposite direction. And any attempt to use, to use spirituality as a means to feel better psychologically, in my opinion, lacks integrity. It, it's that stark. It's that stark. Now, I don't mean integrity necessarily as in truthfulness or honesty. I don't, I don't mean that. So if someone's doing that, they're not dishonest. I mean wholeness, completeness, um, pureness. When I say integrity, that's how I'm using the word. And I think it's a very, in this community, I think that that, those lines have been blurred. And I think they were blurred innocently way back by Sid himself. And and I think it's worth, worth noticing, worth kicking it around, and worth looking at how Sid's original seeing and work um, evolved as a result of the blurring of those lines. So, so if I'm hearing you correctly, psychology works on the self. Spirituality is pointing to that there is no self. So there's no self to work on. Is that so far what you're saying? Well, fair enough. Yes. Is that fair? And I actually like what you said. Uh, Pramila agreed that on a relative level and a truth level, that was, a, I was going to actually ask you that, that it sounds like there's a disagreement, but on a relative level or on a surface level, it sounds like a disagreement on a truth level there. It's simply another belief. If, if, if that's fair to say, whether, well, no. well just, uh, you were, we were, you were getting there until the word belief. Okay. Oh, oh, oh you mean, you mean, that there's a, that, oh, oh, I see. You mean that there's a disparity between the two? That's correct. Another, yes, that's yes, correct. That's, that's correct. Another, that's another belief. Because ultimately, it, it, both concepts are appearing are, and are made of the same thing. Yes, so, exactly. So that's what I was pointing to. At a truth level, there's no difference. It, it's all the same. So, but, but we're not speaking. We, we are speaking at a relative level. Human beings, separate cells, will always be communicating at a relative level, 
Now you could say, well, maybe in intimacy, we fall out of that relative level. And even with a client, we can fall out of that relative level. But I don't think we should mix all that in. It, what, what we as human beings, as separate self, see is a world of separation. And that causes massive conflict for a person. And the world of psychology is very relevant in, in certain circumstances. I, I would actually venture to say more circumstances than not of helping that separate self calm down, quiet down. And this, quite frankly, is what um, psychologists such as George, such as Keith, such as uh, Richard Carlson was, are incredibly competent at. Bill Pettit, incredibly competent at. They're, they're in my mind, tops of the field. So, um, again, though, it's mixing it with spirituality where I think the confusion ramps up. So, you, you were mentioning Sid Banks, um, and you mentioned he, he took a, a, a turn as well. What would you consider purely spiritual and then him mixing it to psychological, what would you consider a spiritual paradigm? It, 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 you know, just to give a co contrast to what you believe is psychological. Well, it, it, in looking at this, in looking at this several years ago and having, having a client kind of wake me up to my own bullshit, to be honest, to be honest. Um, he didn't know he did that. Um, and having me really take a look at whether I was propagating beliefs, whether I was uh, teaching that which I had no experience of, which is a belief. Um, in looking at that square in the face, um, and to that end, by the way, I just want to stop for a second and say, I don't want anyone to believe what I'm saying today. <laughs> Check in with your own experience and see if it adds up. I made that mistake. And my teachers made the mistake of not telling me that many years ago, innocently, innocently. I, I haven't said those words most of my career either, but now I always do. So, so don't believe me. Check in with your own experience and see if it, will, if it lines up. And if it doesn't, feel free to ask questions. So um, what, what I realized was that Sid woke up to the, that who we are is pure, say it any way you want, consciousness, God's infinite being, love. Sid described it as thought. But who we are is, is we, we share a being. We share a being. And I think this is very evident in Sid's early work, that this is the perspective he was speaking from. Now, as I learned in my investigation, um, Which was, which was aided greatly by, uh, by Linda Quaring reaching out to me. Uh, I did not know Linda. I, had no, I knew she had written some books about the early years with Sid, but Linda just out of the blue reached out to me. And she encouraged me to keep going. Um, quite frankly, it was, it, I had never received such support from any so-called leader in the community like that when she did that, ever. It was actually very contrary to the other advice I was getting and I had gotten over the years, which when I got inquisitive and I would ask questions, I was always told that I was thinking too much. You're thinking too much. You've got to look for the feeling. You're too intellectual. And there was something about that that just never added up for me. And I used to tell George, you're not thinking enough. <laughs> so it was kind of, we had fun with that over the years. It was just funny and it was fun. But, but um, and I would encourage you guys to, to inquire like mad. Keep inquiring, rigorously inquire. Um, anyway, Linda encouraged me. She said I was really speaking the original language of Sid. This was a lovely first email I received from Linda. And 
because of Linda, I, in our conversations, I, I, I learned some interesting things. For, for one, I learned that uh, the people of Salt Spring, all these so-called hippies would flock to listen to Sid, Linda being one of them. And the, the people at Salt, Salt Spring, where Sid lived, were getting, were getting very irritated by the mess these so-called hippies were making. And I remember when this was, late 60s, I think, early 70s, whatever. My parents were of that generation. And anyway, um, so Sid didn't know what to do with that because here's an innocent guy just speaking truth and people are trashing the island and blaming Sid for it. And then George and, and Roger showed up and George and Roger were the opposite of someone who would trash the island. They were respectful. They were uh, educated. They were, uh, they just were themselves, as you know. And Sid saw an opportunity in George and Roger to help get the message out there and, and thus the message turn from a more uh, true nature bent or spiritual bent or non-dual bent to the world of psychology. Now, now you can get that story better from Linda, but it's, it's I'm close in that story. Um, so, and, and that's when Sid really got interested. And if you notice, Sid's, even Sid's garb changed. He, he was dressing very like guruish, and then all of a sudden he's wearing a tie and jacket. And people like Linda didn't like that. They were like, what, you're selling out. And Linda didn't, as you know, probably, Linda didn't talk to Sid for like 10 years. For 10 years, they didn't speak. And, um, all right, I'm going to say something very poignant to the teaching, so get ready. So Linda was invited to see Sid at one of his California lectures, because Linda lives in California. And after the lecture was over, uh, Linda went backstage and, and, and Sid said, what do you think? And he said, and Linda as Linda recounts this, he says this kind of sheepishly. And Linda says, I think you lost it. I think you lost it. And uh, Sid says, I know. I, I've cheapened it. I've cheapened it. And um, th th people have questioned me of how I know that Sid regretted taking this teaching strictly to the world of psychology. And that's how I know. Um, so. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think Sid regretted it in his later years that he had he had taken it away from the from the the non dual nature of, of his training. Sid was a Sid studied Alan Watts, Krishnamurti, and also of his his own realizations. And um, I think that the teaching has gone further out in that direction. And I've come back online over the past three or four years, interacted more, um, quite frankly, in an attempt to take it, to take it back to its, to its purity. And I think, I think um, that some of the original teachers have done, are starting to do the same. You know, the, the, A, a, a psychological, a, a community based on psychology, a community based on a personal perspective, in this case, an inside out perspective, um, an idealist perspective as opposed to a materialistic perspective. This perspective is still a personal perspective. So ultimately, the, the community that is involved in that perspective will be a community of conflict, which sounds funny to say it. And I, and I think that that is, that, is, that is obvious in the genesis of the three principle community. Uh, the original teachers have now gotten together, which is awesome. And they've even copped to this. So you, you see videos where they're saying, we've, we, we're doing this, we're getting together because we've got to get better. 
we've got to get better. We, there's too much acrimony even between us. And there's, and there's many, many, so I was an, I was a young man back then. There was many stories of, of conflict within the elders of this community. Um, I experienced it myself. I experienced, um, uh, people in this community attempting to steal business. Um, I once, um, was helped on an article that I wrote in the early days by a esteemed member of this community. And then I wrote, put the article out there, published it on Huffington Post. And this person uh, accused me of plagiarism because I didn't include him on the byline. It shocked me. I didn't, I thought they were helping me. Uh, much like Joel Drasner does today with my articles. Um, so the, and, and, and then when you come when you come back out into the community and you, you suggest that part of the teaching could, can be cleaned up a little bit, or maybe it's not quite, not quite pure, not, not quite what the man everyone loves so much was saying, and you suggest that. In this type of community, a community from the perspective of a separate self, the one who does that, me in this case, and I'm not the only one, there are others too, but me in this case will be labeled, I'll be labeled as the one who's divisive. And that has definitely happened. But th there's no, there's no, no, I'm not perfect. You know, I can get my dander up with the best of them, but there's nothing personal in it in this case for me. I don't make my living in this community. So, um, yeah, I think that Sid saw that we share a being. Uh, I think an early quote of Sid's was, you know, the will of God is the only will that exists. And, but then he took it to the world of psychology, innocently trying to help people. And I think to a large extent, it lost its way. Wow, that's <clears throat> that's a lot to unpack, and uh, I didn't actually know a lot of the background that you just shared today, and I think it's really, really incredible. Even even this little thing that you said he used to dress in like hippie garb to ties—that's yeah. actually something that's that that metaphorically may be very significant. Who knows? But I, I didn't even take that into consideration. But that is something that's really interesting. Um, there's three questions. Can we get to, because uh, sure. I can ask you a million questions right now, but before we do, let, can, do you mind if we jump on a, on a couple questions? No, I'm good all day. It's cool. Let's do it. Let's start with Mr. Dominic. Oh, boy. I know. I know. How's, oh, how's the oatmeal, buddy? How's that settling? Hey, right. hey, hey thank you. you. You make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, by the way, I can't even conceive what, when you said that your wife said you're a more loving, caring person today. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I didn't know you then. <laughs> but anyway, no, the question that occurred to me is the business that you're in and, you know, how you make your money. And, and I know that how you approach your work is very with integrity to this perspective. Um, and... and, and the business where is so maybe the most results focused uh, business, mm -hmm. just in terms of performance and results, and you know the time you are spending with any of these people must translate into something, or those organizations wouldn't continue to pay you. Um, now, yet your teaching really doesn't get. It, when you're teaching and you're posting, just you don't go there. And I'm just wondering how do you make, I don't know, how do you explain that? Because there is something in what you're teaching that in fact does translate into performance and results. And I'm just wondering how you explain well, it. Yeah, it's cool. So, 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 you know, there's always been an element of, um, you know, I was, a, as some of you know, I was a hard driving player, a very talented athlete, but I, I kind of squandered my, I mean, to a certain extent, I got pretty far in sport, but I squandered my talent, especially on the ice and hockey, 
because it was more important for me to be the hardest grinder on the team than the leading scorer, which is funny, which is funny now. Um, but um, I always, I made my bones in the world of sport first. That was the first place that I, I worked in my consulting business. By, by, when, by simply saying, when someone would come to me saying, I, w- I want our team to win the Stanley Cup or I want to win a championship or I want to win a major golf tournament by saying, I can't help you with that. Now, now I have to admit, talk about integrity and lack thereof. I have to admit back in the day, I used that as a calling card because just it was so different that people, the people's interest perked up. And I knew that, and I took advantage of that. I would never do that for that reason now. But that absolutely was a, a calling card. People said, wow, that's, let me, what's that about? And so that coupled with the fact that in the world of mental performance, that was all about adding. And, and, and this guy was teaching, don't add, let's strip away. That's pretty much how this thing got rolling. So for 20 years, that's all it, and that's all still power in that book says. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a relatively, well, it's a medium-sized book that just says that, right? So, so now, now, it's amazing because I, with, with complete freedom and ease, I say, can't help you with that. Like, it's so natural that I can't help you with that. But I can help you. If you're interested, I can we, can, we can go on a mutual journey, a mutual exploration, and we can really get to the heart of the one question that burns for all of us. Who are we? And that, not for everyone, but mainly in the world of performance, you're dealing with relatively young people, relatively open people. They are genuinely interested in, in what I just said. They have a sense, like we all do, like we all did when we were lying in our beds when we were kids. They have a sense, in fact, that the most, the most practical thing we could ever know is our own being. The most practical thing we could ever know is that we do not share the limits and destiny of the body. We are free. There is nothing more practical you could ever know so if, if, you're, if you're pointing people to, to nature and anyone tells you, well, I need some practical advice, that is the practical, that is the essence of practicality. And we must stand up and, and insist for, that, for people to take a look at that. Because their experience is telling them that that's true. Their belief system will need a, will need a concept, a belief, a strategy. So it truly is. And, and I'm not... You know, it's as we know, it's it's it would be lack complete integrity to say that the major golf tournaments that I've been part a part of, or the, or the or the championships in pro sport, or actors on the screen that I've been I work with, that I'm having to do with that. Hey, their journey, just like it is ours, is the knowing of our own being. Their sacred calling is the knowing of their own being, and. Um, I'm I'm just fortunate enough to, to play a role in pointing people to that, as you are, as you are. Yes, yes, and and as and on an individual basis, it almost makes more sense than with the organ because I could see an individual seeing it, so that per that one person to hire you, and I just wonder how, especially in the sports teams or organizations. Because there's no way that, you know, when you're talking to a sponsor of an organization, I mean, maybe they would get that, but they're the ones paying, right? So they pay you. And then in the end, no matter what you say, they're looking and saying, okay, did this get us results? Did this get us results? It's a great observation. And that is why, and, and from a business perspective, there's other reasons which I, I can briefly touch on. For example, in, 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 in the world of pro sport, the organization generally are much worse players than the players. So, so th- th- that's just a fact of, of business. But, but be that as it may, that is why most of my work is with 
the players individually, not with the teams. That's where it is now. That was not the case originally, but that's where it is. That's where it is today. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's so much great. It's, it's beautiful. It, it's beautiful. And, and what we found is that some of these very players are now going back within the organizations and they're doing the, doing it that th- they're introducing just by that, their very essence and living from that perspective, they're introducing this perspective to their teams and in hockey, as you know, they're wearing the, the C or the A on their sweater. They're, they're the leaders. And, and, you know, we, we've, it's um it's just awesome i mean it, it to to see these young people um this generation of players of athletes um that this is this is on the, this is in the discussion so a an exploration into true nature is in the discussion in this field of so called um mental conditioning although i don't like that word but it's it's in the discussion and it's taken it's taken nearly thirty years for it to be in a discussion where like it, where it is now. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, buddy. Cool. Thank you, Garrett. Um, let me get a couple more. We have uh, Mr. Carlson. Go ahead and jump on. Hello. What's up? What's Hello, up, buddy? Garrett? Hey. Hello, Amir. Nice to see you. Hello. Damn. When you told about coconut Karoshi water, Day, coconut water, not <laughs> water. Very clear here. Yeah. Yeah, when you talked about your, your early days and how George Fransky told you that you're overthinking. Yeah. And and you kind of uh, argued with him a little bit. And then you said, inquire, do the inquiry as much as you can. And to me, Inquiry adds thoughts to, uh, I don't know if it's necessary to inquire. Can you elaborate on that? Why inquiry? So, so, in, so self-inquiry, self-inquiry. Okay, self. self. Yeah, yes. that explains it. Okay, cool. So that makes sense to you. So let's just, let's just plan it for everyone so everybody's clear. So yeah. self-inquiry, yeah. self-inquiry. Another word for self-exploration, self-realization, self-surrender, d- different ways to say it. Takes us, is an inquiry that takes us back to source. So self-inquiry, yeah. self-exploration, we would define that, this is, might surprise some people, as a strategy, okay? I would actually, I'm using that word first. I would describe it as a concession to the, to the, to the purity of the teaching, which I'll go to in a second. So, and self-exploration, the inquiry into who I am, who we are, is the highest concession. It's the most pure and the highest concession of a separate self, okay? So what's, what's different about that? And what you just what what you just saw was that self inquiry takes us back towards source, whereas seeking in concepts strategies of the like would take us away, would take us back out towards objects. So a concession. To a, to a non-dual teaching, a concession to true nature in the teaching would be a strategy that spun the separate self, turned the separate self inward. So one way you could do that is to say, if a player or a client of mine or a friend of mine or any of you guys was really suffering, you, you could say, hey, hey man, like um, on whose behalf is this experience taking place? Is this experience taking place on behalf of a separate self or consciousness itself and in that question the separate self must hold still look at itself and in that question we rob the separate self of its tendency to run 
of its natural activity and it holds still and it returns back to source. Because clearly if suffering is going on, suffering can only be on the behalf of a separate entity, a separate self. So we hold that separate self still and in doing so, the, the mind, the so-called busy mind, will fold into the, into the heart. Derek, I, I, I want to expand, and this might be a, a – and it is a serious question. When we say self-inquiry, how can we have a self-inquiry when there is no self to inquire about according to non-dual teachings? Am I getting this incorrect? No, you're, you're, you're right on. So, okay. so the, the, se- the self – the self – the separate self, the non-existent separate felt, so, and, it, and it may be worth it after I explain this to, to dig into how do we know the separate self doesn't exist, which is what you just said. But yeah. that, for now, for now, to, to one who is convinced that he or she is separate, it is, it is, my role in this case to show that that's not so. Remember I was saying the difference between belief and experience to show that your experience is not what you think it is. So the the minute that separate self holds still and is robbed of its so-called fuel supply, it realizes it was never there to begin with. It was imaginary to begin with. But, but we, we, we have our, a, a teacher, a coach would have his or her ways of, of, of revealing that, revealing that. Um, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but a, a, a sep, it's, it's like, it's like, if you look at, everyone looks at the screen right now, if you, if you see a bunch of the boxes, it will appear like right on the screen, there's like 25 boxes. But if I touch the screen, what I find is that this appearance of separation is not true. Those lines of distinction are just appearances on the screen. That it's, we're all made of the screen. And if we're all made of the screen, we all are the screen. So from the perspective of this image, this separate self, I will see separation as I look around. It's knowing that that separation isn't true. That is, that knowing is what the world has forgotten. So is it fair to say when we're inquiring, because the self is involved, we can't, in other words, how can we find, I guess you answered is by through experience itself, because the minute we discuss inquiring the self something needs to inquire and the only thing that can inquire is a separate self well nothing is ever really inquiring which is just batshit crazy crazy. right okay now we're getting that's what i was pointing exactly okay fair enough the the inquiry that's going on is is not what we think it is so you know when sid bank said there's the chair there is the chair real sid sid was not saying that the chair isn't real he was what he was really pointing to was the chair is not made of what you think it's made of. So the, the chair is not made of matter, for example. The, the, the chair is simply an image within consciousness made of consciousness, as we all are. As we all are. So it's not saying that this world we see isn't, isn't real. It's saying this, or this, you know, you and, and my office here isn't real. It's not real in the manner that we think it's real, that we've been trained to think it's real, that we've been trained to believe it's real. It, it's, 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 it's made of consciousness. It's all consciousness. And this is, this, is, this is, again, what the world has forgotten. And I'm not saying you should explore consciousness for the reason that's the road to world peace. I'm saying explore consciousness as i just said it's batshit crazy cool you know like it's just cool like if you if in a very simplistic sense buddy like no one 
has yet to find an object, a so-called object, outside of the infinite and eternal space we call the universe. No one. No one has ever experienced an object outside of the universe or outside of consciousness. No one has ever found an edge to this infinite and eternal space we call the universe or we call consciousness. Nothing that has ever happened within this infinite and eternal space that we call the universe or consciousness has ever damaged the universe or consciousness. I don't think anyone, the experience the experience of anyone in this call will differ from what I just said. What I just said was that the, the universe consciousness is infinite. No one's found an edge to it. And it's eternal. Nothing has ever damaged it. And because no object, no person has ever appeared outside of that space, not yet, <laughs> our experience, we're going to stick with experience here. What that indicates is that all objects are one with the space. And, and even more precise, all objects are made of the space. All objects are made of consciousness. And again, if anyone's experience is contrary to that. Now is the time to, to speak up or ask or kick it around. That's what inquiry is, by the way. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a problem if your experience is different or you think it's different to speak up and say it. That, that's how we strip away these, these conditions, beliefs of this body that we've been trained to be. We're going to get to see, and I really like what you're saying. Um, the only I would say in my own conflict is if it's all happening within the screen or consciousness, then why are we spending so much time concerning ourselves with a separate self when that also is within consciousness? In other words, there's nothing to fix. There is no ego. It's included. Uh, we're just using different terminology to talk about what's in the same space as all the other things. So, so what would be the point of teaching when all we're telling people is it's all in here and then the teachers seem to be doing the separation. So we need to, we need to worry ourselves with the ego. We got to worry ourselves with a separate self. We need to not do this and do this. Well, it seems that if it's all in one consciousness, the only teacher would be to say nothing. That, that's true. Right. The, 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 that's true. The, the purest, the purest teaching teacher is silence. There's, there's no, no question, but you have to, but, but what, what we're dealing with here is on this webinar right now, 80 conditioned body minds who silence won't be good enough for them. For these apparent separate selves, silence won't, won't work. So, so we have to, we have to kind of get to the, to the level of where we're at, where our culture is at right now. And our cult, where our culture is at right now is a, a, a materialistic paradigm. Separation, separate objects, subject and object. And we have to start there and strip away beliefs until we get to what, where you just said. And we, but we can't start there. We can't start there. So my suggestion is know yourself, know yourself. Your greatest gift to the universe is knowing yourself. And, fr and from, from there, go back out into this apparent world of separation and do your thing, however you do it, H however you do it. Um, I think as Dominic was, was kind of gathering like, that's what these 
athletes are doing. They're knowing themselves and then they're going back out into this apparent world of separation and they're expressing joy, love, peace, happiness, consciousness in the material world. And people are getting a glimmer of that. What does that guy know? What is that woman? What's, what's she about? That's why we, we Sue would always say that. He, he, would, he would insist that you understand. Don't worry about all that. You understand and then go. He was on the money with that. He, he was on the money with that. Oh. So we're not, buddy, we're not discarding this apparent world of separation. We're explaining it. We're exploring it. We're, we're, and we're, what, we, what we ultimately will find is that these lines of separation are not real. They're not there. They're an illusion. Brilliant. Let me uh, get Sia on the line. Um, Hello, thank you. Go for it. How are you? Yes, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Garrett. Uh, and well, I'm rather new to this understanding, and based on the limited knowledge I have, I guess uh, my question is based on where you stand with this and, and what the message I'm hearing, and I've read and I've watched some of your videos. Would you say that you belong to the three principles uh, culture, understanding, uh, and community, or do you see some discrepancies there where you're coming from with what is being told and, and, and expanded upon uh, these days? And if that is the case, how do you separate between the two, please? Sure. So, so I, I am in deeply, uh, 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 again, on a, on a, on a personal level, so to speak, from, from, from Garrett's perspective, I am deeply indebted to Richard and to Keith and to George and to, and to Sid. They, they showed up on my journey at a time where I had never experienced such grace and wisdom and humor and humility. I, I, I had never, you know, I, I, they, they, I needed that. I needed, I needed what I needed. I was all over the place and I needed to, I needed to chill out. And I'm just lucky that that's how it, that's my journey. So I will, I will tell you that I will, I will always be part of the community. It's, it's near and dear to my heart. However, a community is one where we must be free to disagree and to debate and to explore and to criticize openly. And there's no right or wrong in that. I'm not saying there's a way to do that. Like, I'm not going to say you have to do that with compassion or love and all this stuff. I'm not, I'm not even suggesting. I'm saying just be you. And I find that, um, interestingly enough, where, where, that's, where that's rejected the most is in the elders of the community, which is interesting to me because Sid Banks is the very essence of someone who was labeled divisive and who broke a mold within a community. And that, that's what Sid did. And he did it with, as, as, I've, as Keith has told me many times, without, I mean, no holes barred, he did it. He, he stuck to his gun so much that he, you know, he burned some bridges. His social skills weren't necessarily the best. Right. So I, 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 I am, I am, I, Sid Banks realized that, that we were one. 
And somehow this teaching has gotten into the personal. Right or wrong, I'm not saying it's wrong, we have three principal practitioners for every field under the sun. Every ailment, you, we got to pre- and so, and I'm not saying that's wrong, I, but, but th- that's not what Sid originally saw. So let's just be okay with that. Let's not call it something that's not. It, that's fine. But let's, let's cop to the fact that's not what Sid originally saw. And it's fine. So, um, you know, there are, as I said, there are many great psychologists in this community, many great life coaches in this community. But to, to say that what they're teaching is a spiritual teaching, again, back to the subject matter at hand, that's, that's, not, that's not up. That doesn't add up. It just doesn't add up. I mean, I mean if, you're, if you're talking about things like levels of consciousness, um, hmm, trust your own wisdom, this type of thing, Feeling your thinking? Is that one that you... Thinking. Uh, deepening levels go. Look to people's innate mental health. The wisdom rests in you. The only place your experience comes from is you. These are all... And, and, and sometimes when I say what I'm saying now, people will say, what are you talking about? I've always been teaching. But no, th- th- this is not spiritual. Levels of... Consciousness is the only thing that does not have levels. Consciousness is... It just is. It doesn't move, change. It doesn't morph. Consciousness is is the only thing that never changes, that's eternal. And thing is just in quotes. So to to speak of levels of consciousness is, is, is just not a spiritual, um, it, it lacks of spiritual integrity. It's not, not on purpose. Not on, I'm not saying so, someone is to blame for doing that, it, but, it, but it's, it, I, I think from, from a, 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 the perspective of consciousness would laugh at that idea. <laughs> it, it, it just, it can't be. It can't be. We can't deepen levels of consciousness does not have levels. Now, if I'm using, if you want to use a different word, God doesn't have levels. Awareness doesn't have levels. We don't become more or less aware. We are awareness itself. Now, from the perspective of a separate self, there's levels. But that's a psychological perspective. And the psychological perspective will love loves to pull us away from the spiritual perspective. So it will bastardize it with the best of them. It will do it. It will twist it. It will pull us away from the purity. That's the game of the ego, the separate self. And it's really important to see that. We, 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 if we start to use truth, spirit, God, consciousness, as a means to cope, we are, we are playing the ego's, the ego's game. We, we have fallen from grace. And if someone disagrees with that, then that's fair. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm right, and I don't want you to believe me. Just see how it lines up for you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I always... Uh... The way I understood it was that just these different levels of consciousness is kind of like a creating a logical ladder for us to be able to climb up into something which is not logical at all. So I've always had a problem with that, where that, that comes into this conversation. But uh, also maybe that might be a way for us to find a way to get our way out of our own thinking. But again, it's like it's part and comes back again because the whole thing is just nonsense then. But you, but, but you don't have to get out of your thinking. See, the, 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 the very idea, the very idea that you have thinking, an idea that is a belief 
that is held dear by the, this community is contrary to your experience. The, the, the very idea that you have thoughts in your brain, thoughts in your head, where, how? You, you, you've never found a thought in your head. You, 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 it's, never been, it's never been found even by neuroscientists, a thought in a head, let alone peons like you and me. So this idea that our thinking creates our experience when no one's ever had a thought in their head is just shows the, the starkness of where we've gone. It's just a belief that we have thoughts in our heads. It's a belief, belief that we could have a jammed up head. How can you have a jammed up head? Has anyone ever experienced more than one thought at a time? Of course not. It's a belief. It's a belief. Now, if that starts to be, hmm, consider yourself as a thought. Remember Sid Banks said it's all thought? Sid didn't mean everything's, you feel thinking. It's all you're feeling you're thinking. He meant it's all the same. It's all consciousness. It's all God. He didn't mean your experience comes from thought. Sid knew, the way I see it, Sid knew that a human being has never had an experience. A human being cannot have an experience. How would a human being have an experience? How? What part of this body right here has the power to have an experience? It's not there. What part of this body has the power to know something? Where? My elbow? My brain? My ear? What? Where? What part of this body has the power to think? You can't find it. These are all beliefs. This webinar starts, this webinar starts, and boom, you appear on the screen. A thought appears and appears to divide the screen. There you are. Then boom, I pop up. A thought appears. I am a thought. You are a thought. Thought is nothing more than the mechanism consciousness uses to create the appearance of separation. That's it. That's it. And then you dissolve back into the screen, absent of thought, no thought. And then oh, another thought, another you. There we are. With each thought, a new you appears. A new me appears. Appears. Because ultimately, they're just modulations on the screen modulations or vibrations within consciousness made of consciousness from the perspective of consciousness know you and me so these are the type of beliefs that are so ingrained in us that we don't even recognize them as beliefs we, we actually recognize them as truths they're so ingrained in us. We have thoughts in our head. I even say that sometimes. That's ah, just another thought in my head. It's so ingrained in me. And I don't know about you, but I find it fascinating, this discussion, to kick it around and consider it. Consider it. This has been a fascinating conversation, and we're actually done. So I think... Uh, I can and Dominic, have more time if you okay. want. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have 15 more minutes. So I'm going to give Dominic the the floor. He has to have two questions on every webinar. It's just the rule. It's, uh, <laughs> but before I give it to him, I did want to ask or or state when we say we can't find a thought, I don't know if that's necessarily the direction I would point to to say that it doesn't exist. In the same sense that I have digestion but you can't find it out there unless there's a stomach. So I wouldn't say digestion doesn't exist because we can't find it out there. It's that digestion exists intros introspectively or together with a stomach. So, you know, 
in no, that? No, no, brother. No. Is that is that is that not true? Like, does does digestion exist exist outside of a stomach? D but d digestion, <laughs> a stomach digestion, are just are just are mere images within the whole. So let's say you have indigestion. Let's say someone has in the discomfort of indigestion. Okay. When it becomes an issue is when that discomfort is assumed from the perspective of the body, which is the direction you're going. So that's where it becomes discomfort. That's where it becomes problematic. Whereas if our, my dog had digestion, uh, indigestion, there, there may be discomfort, but it wouldn't be held within her body. It would be absorbed into the whole of consciousness because she does, how would she know that she's even a body? So an animal wouldn't know that it's a body. How, how would it know that? So that, that, that sensation you're referring to, or I'm referring to as indigestion, would then be absorbed into the whole of consciousness. It would, the, my, the dog wouldn't suffer. The animal wouldn't suffer. We suffer because we take that pain as that indigestion, that discomfort as, oh, it's, my, it's mine. I, I, that's in my body, my separate body. And, and this is why some, sometimes, and everyone's experienced this, so-called physical ailments have been handled with ease. And other times, the smallest little thing can make us feel awful. Well, because we, when, 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 we, when we kind of, when those ailments are absorbed into the whole field of consciousness, accepted and, and by, the, by consciousness, there's no suffering. The, the suffering doesn't exist. It's when, it, it's when the body grabs onto it that suffering mounts. So the, the, the stomach, the indigestion, the, the, the body are all vibrations within the whole. The, 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 they're, 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 the, the body is simply a sensation within consciousness, just like, just like this, this, uh, this cup is a vibration within consciousness, objects. And objects love to be influenced and reach out to other objects. It's the very nature of objective experience. We, we love to do that. And then, and then at, at some place in time, and you and I have discussed this, at some place in time, we sit back and we say, you know, I can't find myself in objects. My, when I, it no longer makes sense to us to connect our identity, who we are, to the body, to money, to status, to um, whatever, to achievements. And, and that happens, that happens for all of us. It stops to make sense to connect our pain to our bodies at some point. And we realize that that pain is simply an object. And when I say object, I mean something that is known. Okay, so an object, this cup, this body, a thought, a feeling, a sensation, something that's known. An, an, ob an object cannot find sustenance, sustenance or relief in other objects at some point we wake up to that, we wake up to that, and we, we look inward. Who are we then? If not an object, who am I? And, and that's what this, and I, I, will hold, I will contend that that's what Sid did. That's what Sid Banks did. That's what happened to Sid. He stopped for a second, I would describe it that, Consciousness actually stopped, not Sid. The veil was lifted by consciousness, and Sid s spun around and headed home. And I, I want to be clear, you guys. Like, this is not on you. Like, 
the, the, if, if, we're, if we have forgotten who we are, it is consciousness, it is God who has forgotten, not you, not you. Not you. And, and if you wake up, it is God that has lifted the veil, not you, not the body-mind. So, and, and that's part of this journey. That's why I talk about it as a sacred, a sacred calling. A sacred calling, because it, it's a, when the, when the prodigal son headed out to find himself, consciousness had, had, had veiled itself. And then when the prodigal son spun around, before that happened, consciousness lifted the veil and prodigal son returned home. And that's what we're all doing here. Beautiful. Thank you, G. Um, are you are you okay for another question? We only have we have a, it's got to be a short one, Dominic. I'll let you take this one, and then after this, uh, you guys all thank you. First of all, this has gone over an hour, and everyone's been just listening intently, and I really appreciate everything you've been saying, Garrett. So, let me get Dominic so he. Gets. Okay. Uh, yes, Garrett. Um, the you made the point before around um, the the. Um, you know, when you kind of go back, find yourself in, in consciousness, and then you come back and express into the world. Um, so that, I guess when you're looking at that, I know the experience of it, there are two different experiences, but someone watching sees, like I think of myself before, striving for things, wanting to achieve things, and then hitting a place of, I don't know, connecting with something, and then the action, which to anybody else might look the same, would would come across. How would how would it, you know it's an expression of something versus? I know in the feeling it's an expression of something versus the striving of something. But I, I guess this is a bit of the confusion for anybody who. I don't know, looks at that. How, how is someone coming from a separate self or how is someone as expressing a perspective of self? Well, you're, you're always coming from the perspective of a separate self. You're, you're always coming from the perspective of a separate Yeah, that is a good question. We'll get to that if we can, Amir, after this. So we're, you're always coming from the perspective of a separate self. Always, always. The way I would describe it in, in this limited amount of time, the way I would describe it is just hang, hang in there with me on this, you guys. So um, on this screen of consciousness, look at your computer now and just pretend it's an infinite screen. There's a slight vibration on the screen. This is a newborn coming into the world. Okay. Now, this newborn looks out and it sees one infinite unified whole. It doesn't see separation. How would it know separation? How would it know? It wouldn't know. It hasn't learned that yet. It doesn't know that objects are separate. It sees one experience, has one experience just like the fish in the sea. They don't know, they wouldn't define the rocks and this and that, they don't know that. But, but over time, as life goes on, so-called life goes on, this newborn separates itself out from its mother's body, from its room, from its house, from its surroundings, and a, and a separate self, a separate self is solidified. This is all of our journey. In fact, this is the journey of 99.9%. Well, not what I mean to say is 99.9% .9 of us have, have taken that journey. And then the, for, for, for those, that percentage of people, the overwhelming percentage, the journey ends there in separation. I am a body mind. This is who I am. Okay. Now, that that separate self lives a life of suffering. 
and, and more accurately described, and everyone I think will relate to this, lives a life of the pain pleasure cycle. We feel discomfort, anxiety, suffering, insecurity. We do something or even do nothing. And then we find relief because we stop seeking for a second. We find temporary relief and then it kicks back up again. So that is the, the, plain, the pain pleasure cycle of being a human being. And if we're all honest, everyone will admit that that's their life. <laughs> that's our life, okay? But as I said before, at some point that becomes illogical. And at that moment, the veil lifts and we, we turn it back around and we start heading home. And we stop identifying and looking for relief in, in substances, in relationships, in activities, in practices, in disciplines. Now, to your question, Dominic. What this journey does is it, it bit by bit chips away at ego and it creates a more, as I said earlier in this call, a more genuine, loving, honest, separate self. So I, I'm not, I don't want anyone to sit here and try to find and have an experience of oneness or something like that. That's not what this is. This is about taking a look at our, ourselves, taking a look at experience, stripping away beliefs, and getting to a more, a more genuine version of the image you're meant to be. Now, it's not back to an infant. It's not back to that. That would be foolhardy. That, that's not what I'm saying. It is, it is experience merging back into consciousness as the infant would be conscious is merging out with experience. So, so that's what this journey is. That's what, that's what my experience, and I would say my friends on this call, that's our experience. That's your Very experience. clear. Very clear. Thank you. That, that was very clear. Yeah, we're not trying, we're not, we're not sitting here and suggesting that there's two worlds here. I, this is a big mistake in this teaching. That's, that's New Age Spirituality 101. It's just not what this is. We will, we will, the belief in separation vanishes. The appearance of separation remains. Okay? But you know you know what you see is not true. It's not true. That is the practicality we were speaking about earlier. So the belief that you are a separate self goes, thus the belief you will see, the perspective you see from will confirm that perspective. So when the belief of separation goes, you still see separation, you just don't fall for it as much or as much and as much and bit by bit, bit by bit, we become back, we, we get back to true nature, the image that God made us, who we are meant to be. Thank you. All right, brother. What was that question, Amir? It was good. I can't, I don't, I can't read it all, so you tell me. Yep, so is having an insight having a thought? Now you have five minutes, go. Is having an insight having a thought? No, it, it, you don't, no one has ever had an insight. It's, it's not, it's, that's just the belief. And, and insight is the, the dissolution, is the, is the momentary dissolution of the separate self. So it is a momentary absence of thought. It's an absence of thought. And then thought returns, and then we put words to this experience and we describe that as an insight. But an insight is the dissolution of the image on the screen. It's a returning to source. It's a momentary falling in love. And then when thought returns, we would, just, we would put words to it and we would label that an insight. But you haven't, it's a momentary, again, dissolution of separation. It, it, that's all it is. And then you'll, you'll the, the, the ego loves to grab hold of it and sound like 
you know, try to describe what just happened, then we'll always flounder. And, and then, and then that's why all these insights that you hear, they, they become personal. Oh, I had the insight about my, uh, my wife and my relationship. Well, no, and ins- that, that's just, that's just the ego grabbing hold of the ego returning and then trying to own that space, trying to own that, that, uh, that experience, so to speak. Gee, this has been one of the most uh, unique, yeah. different uh, guests, obviously, every time you come on. And I think that we need to do part two. I think, you know, it, it's unfortunate when we do an hour, hour and 15, because I feel like we, we dive into it, we start getting into the heart of it, and it's time to go. So maybe instead of saying we get on again and do another one is, is to continue this conversation if you're down. If, if anyone here would like that. Yeah, I, you know, like, you guys, I really, um, I just, I, as I said in that before, you know, the community, it's such a great community. And, and I think we all should just kind of kind of take a look at um, like one thing, Amir, you've done, you've done is you've created a community of, of how I would describe it would be absent of blame so a lot of stuff gets flung around right but because you don't because of a basic understanding of your who you are you see that there's really no blame going on here so people could say things or do things and you you know that this idea of personal responsibility or personal accountability or personal doership is just an illusion so you don't blame anyone Thus, what you've created is a community of cooperation. And, there's, and, th- and that's, why, that's why it's growing. That, that's why you've created the biggest community. And quite frankly, I, this is going to kind of definitely come off the perch of purity. I think, as you and I have discussed, I, I think it's, it's amazing that the so-called leaders of the greater community have not recognized what it is about this community and you that has, uh, has, has allowed that to happen. And I, I think that that's something that I, it, uh, they should take a look at that because it seems to me the opposite is going on. They're kind of keeping you at bay and that, and you know, I, that, that hurts me and I get, I can get upset about that with the best of them. But well, I, I, I do appreciate that. And uh, yeah, but, but, but hopefully anyway. they'll come around. I, I mean, and you're right. What you're saying, I mean, all joking aside, um, I'm, uh, I don't know if I'm causing a riff and I'm not trying to, but I think it's important that, you know, this community became to what it is because of fresh ideas, different conversations, things that were considered sacred or unholy are being discussed and it's opening up uh, new conversations. And I think that's important. I think it's incredibly important. What you're doing, I think is important. It's not a matter of whether we're agreeing or disagreeing. It's that we're laying it all on the table. Let's see what we find. Yes, and I think it's all, important. Right. We're ultimately we're all we're all we're all in search of ourselves. We're all in search of happiness, of peace, of love, of intimacy. We all are. And in order to do that, we as you just said, brother, we have to kick it around. We have to explore. We have to uh uh, be open to to good old fashioned debate, absent of blame. That's how you get somewhere. Bingo, bingo. That's yeah. how marriages last. That's how friendships endure. That's how teams thrive. And that's what that's what we have here. And I think that um, um, I, I I I I I'm I just think community is a place where we should. Oh, we should take advantage of this social media thing going on and openly express and, and have and, and, and just keep looking and keep looking. Um, we don't have, as you said, we don't have to share the same teaching and all that. That's not necessarily important. We just have to be, we're just all headed back to who we are and back to how ha- we all are just looking for happiness and peace. And there's no one on this call who's not. Beautiful, beautiful. Mm-hmm. Garrett, thank you again, and thank you for everybody that's joined us. Honestly, we've, we've had such incredible questions, and um, 
I want to do this again. G, if you're down, uh, I'd love to do this again. I'd love to get people on here. We've had everyone saying thank you. Yes to part two. All right, cool. And um, yeah, on that note, Garrett, love you from the bottom of my heart. You already know that. And uh, we'll see you guys all soon. This will be up uh, later on today. Love you too, buddy. Bye, everybody. Guys. Bye, everyone. Big love. See you guys. Big love. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Made a lot of things clear. Thank you all. It's been very good. Thank I'm you. Awesome, Thanks. Take care, you guys. Bye. Thanks.